Okay. Um, moving into the next chapter, settlers move in. Oh, uh, I should ask any general questions before I just jump into the lecture. All right. Um, so chapter seven, settlers move in. Uh, picture from the book, I believe, uh, of some of the old paddle boats. Um, well, this doesn't work. Of course. <clears throat> um, you know, there were different waves of immigration, and they changed a bit depending on the main transportation type. Um, you know, another reason, part of the reason the Twin Cities are where they are is that's about as far north as you can navigate up. The Mississippi being a real big river, so you could have larger vehicles. Um, and you could have smaller rafts going down smaller tributaries, but uh, the general immigrant surge kind of, uh, well, often people would take different means of transportation in, in those different little areas. Uh, I don't know if people have ever gone on a ride on any of these. They still, people like have weddings on them and stuff. Mm -hmm. Probably. If, uh, you might not have realized you're experiencing what many, many of maybe your ancestors rode these into the state, uh, or maybe not. <clears throat> uh, Steamboats, uh, you know, I think I got a schematic on here somewhere, but um, using the same technology as, as stream, steam, uh, steam trains did, uh, you know, burning different fuel could be wood because there's plenty of that. Uh, we do also have some coal in the state. Coal can also be used for that kind of a thing. Um, it was also used for moving troops, uh, well, back and forth uh, in, in the Civil War. Uh, Minnesota had a pretty large contingent that, that fought. <clears throat> um, another couple of examples, kind of bigger one, kind of smaller one. Oh, here's a schematic I was talking about. Um, this doesn't give you a lot of info, but kind of shows you in general the inside layout if you've not been in one. Uh, things like dining cars and all that. Don't they have the, well, like, well, look for it, like, you can go down these Ontario's Falls now, which, like, down by there, they still have those tours. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think you're right, too, yeah. I think that they still have tours. Actually, I've been meaning to do that specifically over by Taylor's Falls. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been meaning to do that for years. Duh. So. The, the Stillwater steamboats aren't terribly expensive. I just went on one for, with a friend. They're not too bad. How, awesome. About how much? They go anywhere from like 40 to like under 100 mm -hmm. per person. So it's not, not terrible for one or two per people. How looking along of a ride is that? I think it's like a two hour ride. Hmm. Um, it tells you, I don't remember off the top of my head, but you get a free meal too. You get a meal too with it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and they have good dining car, or dining cars and things about trains, <laughs> dining areas. Uh, and, uh, well, and as you can imagine, there's lots of them uh, that still exist that really don't have a lot of purpose. They're, they're, they're not that valuable for conveying stuff as much anymore. Uh, our, our new immigrants these days unlikely to need these, right? They're gonna be flying in. <clears throat> How unfortunate would it be if one of those things sunk and you would have that sh expensive chandelier with all that <laughs> stuff in there? It's called the Titanic. Well, I mean... At least in the river you can just dredge it back up, mm -hmm. whereas it's not lost forever. Uh, of course, Titanic wasn't lost forever either, but most of its stuff was. <clears throat> uh, as I was saying, um, well, after a while, uh, the, the steam train uh, basically took over. Um, and when the book talks about a uh, hub and spoke system, it's actually a similar system that we have for our, our highways that kind of go around the central cities. Uh, you'll have a hub, right? The main place where everything's coming together. Uh, and then you usually have a circular, These this is in the early days, so they don't have the full kind of circle, uh, but that's, what a hub and circle is supposed to look like, kind of like a, a wheel of a bike, right? Um, well, 
along these rail lines, uh, again, that was uh, uh, huge amounts of money to be made, huge amounts of money to be made. Uh, and often the money made on property and sales uh, would go to reduce how much fares were to keep people on them. Uh, similar happened with like trolleys, uh, when we had trolley transportation in local cities. <clears throat> Uh, just some pictures I looked up of some historical examples of the different uh, things, like obviously a train here. <clears throat> uh, another one of the one of the earlier trains. See, it's a bit smallish. <clears throat> um, spread of settlement. Spread of settlement. This is another picture from the book. You can kind of tell the ones that I take from the book and the ones that I look up online because the ones that are from the book are just kind of like you know just taking pictures with my phone. Um, so there, you know, we've been talking about small town decline in America, not just Minnesota, but in the United States in general through time. Uh, and it was all around the same time period, uh, basically when the economy switched over from being agricultural based to an industrial economy. Right, um, agricultural based economy. Of course, we need people spread out. We need people out at the farms doing the farm work. Uh, industrial age, uh, you know, those mills that had started up. Uh, need people working on those mills. Need people working on those mills. Um, so most small towns have been on decline, usually unless they're within like an hour or two of the central cities. Those small towns often, uh, many of them have increased in size and become kind of suburbs. Um, you know, don't forget the, the term suburb, uh, is, it's supposed to be a pejorative, it's sub, it's not as good as the urban, right? It used to be where people didn't want to live. Uh, again, that was when people were getting around either on their feet, uh, or by horseback, or by train. It's like, well, who wants to live way out there? It's like, well, give it a hundred years, and then people did. <clears throat> Uh, Red Wing Bluffs, uh, another example of, uh, of some of the areas uh, that that steamships came in. That's a huge one, actually, looking at it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, percent of Minnesota, not born in Minnesota, um, really skyrocketed through time, right? This is when we had one of our early immigration waves, right? The later 1800s. Um, you know, these, these immigrants weren't all from, from other countries, uh, but many of them were. Uh, I googled pictures of immigrants in Minnesota and randomly kind of got this one from 1925. Um, so through time, as our, as our economy changed over, again, the, the sector of the economy, agriculture, um, and as agriculture itself mechanized more and more, like if you've seen some of these older photos of the old tractors and stuff, it was very kind of small scale and simple um, and, and e often pulled by animals, right? But as the technology improved, you're able to uh, farm more and more land with less and less people, right? Um, and those people, well, they're, and their kids needed jobs and stuff, and typically what would happen is they're one or two of their kids would go to the cities for work and then they would stay. That's how that kind of transition happened. Um, let's see, if you're looking at this little chart here, percentage of the population born in Minnesota, looks like that kind of became the majority, you know, the late 1800s, right? So these populations had moved here and we still had immigrate, immigrants coming in from overseas and other areas of North America. Um, but as you can, you can see, we started, well, local Minnesotans started staying and having kids. Okay. Um, I was trying to look up some more current data. Many of these data sets, for some reason, are always missing a couple decades here, but you know, it doesn't actually change the overall trends you can see here. Uh, immigrants through time into Minnesota, very often from other uh, states, right? Good amount from Europe, 
Then you see the Americas. Uh, it's not until after World War II, really, that immigration to a wider range of countries opened up uh, after World War II. And this is from the book. Um, it's an it's a interesting kind of graph. Uh, so a lot of different ethnicities did move in for specific jobs, uh, for specific work. Um, so for example, if you read about Irish immigrants, uh, very often they, they were not interested in farming. Sometimes uh, they, would, they would sign up to come into the state uh, from Ireland to be a farmer. Uh, but very often when they got here, they'd be like, actually, I farmed a lot back in Ireland and I'm kind of done with it. I'll, I'll live in the city. So there are more urban, urban dwellers. Um, you know, in with German heritage? Austrian, technically. Huh? Austrian? Um, well, you know, it's kind of interesting because uh, Germans in the whole of North America is the largest ethnic group. Uh, but the Germans uh, very quickly assimilated and uh, adopted American culture uh, to replace their traditional culture uh, because of two big world wars where they're the bad guys. And so that's when, you know, everyone collectively was like, well, we're not going to call them Frankenfurters anymore. We're going to call them hot dogs. We're just going to Americanize all of this different stuff. And a number of other cultures who were not the bad guys in those wars uh, kept a number of their kind of old traditional things from the former countries. But the Germans and Austrians especially were just like, we're just going to assimilate. We're just Americans now. Uh, <clears throat> kind of interesting. Well, if you're looking at this chart here, actually the chart, the data that's missing from the other chart uh, is, is this time frame. So we have some data from Minnesota. That, and this is from our textbook. But if you're looking at this, you know, and let's see, if you had Austrian heritage, right? And you were going to guess... Well, what year did they, they likely move here? It's like, well, good chance it was maybe these years, right? Um, less likely maybe these years, but not impossible. Uh, but you can see there's, there's ups and downs, right? There's, well, the percent German, Norwegian, and Swedish went way low, right? Um, like I said, there's lots of things that are happening. But very often, when immigrants no, I mean, this is the classic tale. Immigrants come to the U.S. because often they're getting political persecution back home. Uh, and so these ups and downs would often happen because of things that we wouldn't even know about here happening back in those countries, encouraging a lot of people to shift where they live. There's another one I looked up. Uh, Europe-born Minnesotans. Uh, our book kind of talks about some of the last uh, European ethnic groups that had big rises of uh, immigration into Minnesota were like Russians and Ukrainians, uh, Eastern Europeans, uh, before it was Scandinavians and whatnot. Uh, this little map here shows you where people were moving to. Um, and it's one of those things, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard the, the term chain migration, but chain migration is a, is a common way that migration works. You'll have an immigrant or maybe a family will move to an area, kind of check the place out, right back to home, say, yeah, hey, actually, this area that I am is, is good and you should come here and we'll build a little community. And so that happened with a lot of different places. Uh, but also a number of different places back in Europe had specific types of crops and specific types of soil. Uh, and a lot of the immigrant groups, they were specifically reached out for to farm specific types of crops. Uh, so it was uh, kind of like a headhunter kind of a scenario. Yeah? What's the brown bits there? Uh, you have like Finnish, German, Norwegian, Greek. This? Yeah, well, like what are those two brown bits there? Yeah. Oh, these are, this is Minneapolis and St. Paul. Okay. And so for purposes of this map, there's so many ethnicities in that little area, it's, okay. it's tough to get that data, right? If we zoomed in and we're just looking at these areas, then we could see, because there were neighborhoods. Uh, and you know, the interesting thing is, you could still, if you're in St. Paul or, uh, or Minneapolis and you're driving down random streets, 
often you'll find like an old church, right? In fact, there's kind of like an old church every few blocks. Those are often centers of different ethnic groups' neighborhoods. Uh, often those are not used that much anymore because uh, lots of those places have, uh, and uh, sometimes the churches have changed over because you've had new ethnic groups come in, right? <clears throat> Uh, let's see, oh, like I said, I was trying to find some newer data uh, for immigration into Minnesota. Uh, as you can see, we have, uh, well, through time, we, we, I found out in all these different charts, um, we all get kind of much more of a mixed and more recent, more recent history, right? Um, the U.S. itself had specific laws limiting immigration from a number of different countries for a number of years. Uh, sometimes it was because different wars and whatnot, uh, but there were policies put in place that, uh, I forget what year it was, but uh, laws were put in place saying that immigration was only allowed in the proportion of what the current population was in the US. What that means is, well, they made, around 1917, made laws saying uh, only immigrants that we already have are allowed to keep on coming. And immigrants, groups that we don't have, well, we don't have them, and so therefore we're decided we're not gonna have any. You know? It wasn't until after World War II that that stuff was all kinda opened up. Asian-born Minnesotans immigration, but by a certain year, um, one thing of note, um, there is a, actually a real large and growing Indian population in Minnesota. Um, very often they're working in the high-tech sector, uh, software jobs and things like that, which is a local kind of cluster economy. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get more toward modern days. <clears throat> uh, just an old map of Minnesota. Um, African born by year as well, right? Not to be confused with African Americans who moved up north, which we'll be talking about actually at the end of the class in the, the late homecomer book that we're gonna be reading is gonna be talking about that sort of thing. Uh, but this is obviously from Africa and we have a growing range of, of immigrant groups coming from a wide range of places around the world now. Oh, we're not gonna do these questions right now. <clears throat> I'm gonna keep talking. Well, actually, 